Assalamu alaikum. Happy Women's History Month. And we're so happy to be together today thinking about how hashtag we are our history and how what we are doing here in this Women's History Month to make the history of the future for our children, our grandchildren. We all of us together, but also um, we, we, the women of Rabata, and as we grow together. So uh, Saima is joining me today, Saima Azhar. So Saima, if you could give me a wave, then I'll know what your account is. And I will be able to add you when you ask to be um, added. So that's awesome. All right. So we are here in March. It's a beautiful day. Here in Minnesota, it's snowing. A lot of folks have been like, oh, okay, Saima. I was not sure about that because I have the strange spelling. Awesome. So go ahead and add me and I will let you in. Or not add me, I mean, do you the request again, please? And I will add you. Uh, Alhamdulillah, thank you so much. Yes, we are here thinking about what are we doing? How are we contributing? How are we thinking about the future? How are we thinking about the ummah? How are we thinking about the community? How are we thinking about being, we are our history? So that is what we're here to do. Alhamdulillah. Okay, let me see this. I think I gotcha. All right. I'm excited to talk to Simon. We're kind, we're, we're kind of going across the pond for this conversation, except for that uh, Simon is here in Minnesota. Assalamu alaikum, Simon. Alaikum. Welcome. So happy to have you with me here, both on Instagram and in Minnesota. Yes, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Anse. How do you feel about the snow? Um, well, it was quite terrifying at first, uh, but it's becoming more and more beautiful and not so scary anymore. Alhamdulillah. Uh, why was, what was terrifying about it? That's um, an interesting phrase, having been raised in snow. Yeah, I I don't think we've seen as much snow. We don't get as much snow as there is here. Um, so, so the black ice was the, the terrifying part. Um, but the rest of it looks like a postcard. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mashallah. Oh, everyone is afraid of black ice, so that's totally normal. We, we, we remain afraid of black ice always. That's just, we are, we're always looking out for that. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, this is Saima, everyone. And... Saima is, oh gosh, I, how do I introduce you? There's so much to say. So Saima has been an Arabic teacher for us for many years. I don't remember how many years, maybe you know. I think from the beginning of um, yeah, Rabat. Yeah, so that's almost 10 years, mashallah, since we started an Arabic program. So maybe it's 2014 or 15, yeah. And I've known Saima since. She took a gap year at university. So Saima is coming to us from Minnesota, but she is English. She's visiting now. And she's originally from Wakefield, England. I've been there and had a lot of fun there in Wakefield with Saima and her family and the gals she was teaching up there. But before all of that, she came to Damascus on a one, on a gap year. This is something that you have in England. It's pretty common, I think, right? Yes, yeah. So it was um, a year abroad, a gap year, as part of my Arabic undergraduate degree. And so we had the choice to go to Alexandria or Damascus, and I came to Damascus. And that's where we met. So uh, what a blessed, I'm so glad you chose Damascus, alhamdulillah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So we met there, and then you went back to England, and we stayed in touch. And mashallah, like the work we there's been so many things that you've done for for Rabata. And also, I just want to say a plug here that you also so you also then went back to school. You got your diploma, your teaching diploma. So your undergraduate is in Arabic and in development. Yeah. You have a master's degree in Arabic translation. Yeah. Right. Then yeah. you got your teacher's qualification. So for those of you in the United States, the teacher's qualifications in England is a separate diploma. So it's a it's another diploma, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
graduate um, certificate, which I think is equivalent to a diploma, right. what you would have here as a diploma. Yeah, like a graduate diploma, yep. And then uh, now you are back in school again, mashallah, doing a counseling degree as well. So you are, you're the bra you're a brainy one. Yes, yeah, schoolaholic, maybe, a trying to get all those. Oh, yes. We're similar in that way. Candy for the brain. If, if it was free, yeah. I, I would just stay in school all the time. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> now, recently, Simon's still working for us as an Arabic teacher and very popular one. I saw some of your students saying, I'll say Simon in the chat. So we have some people excited to see you here. Uh, recently, uh, Simon has been doing some more, some other stuff for us as well. And one of these things is that she's, we are working here together. She's voluntarily working here with me on a couple of projects. One of them is an ace, the asynchronous. Just shh, don't tell anyone, okay, Simon, because this is, we have not launched this yet. <laughs> it's still in proposal stage. Yes. But um, without telling anybody except for just the Instagram people. <laughs> Uh, this is a project where we are trying to create something that answers the question for people that have individual questions. So uh, at Ribat, we're doing a whole program, but then sometimes people are like, I, I just want to, I need to learn this smaller thing right now. So you've been working on that. And then the other super exciting thing we've been doing, also maybe don't tell anyone, is working on the three-dimensional classroom. So that's super cool. Actually, we're going to tell people about three-dimensional classrooms. That's okay. Can you, so, okay, sorry. I want to just couch us. We are talking about we are our history, and I'm going to ask you the same questions I'm asking everyone. But before I do that, because I feel like this three-dimensional classroom thing is so important, and it's a, it's a real part of how we're sort of creating that thinking through we are our history here, since it's so related to museums. Could you explain the three-dimensional classroom and what we're, what we're hoping to do. Yes, yeah, so the idea of the three dimensional classroom um, would be you have different kind of mini exhibitions um, based on different themes. So our theme would be the Quran, for example. And uh, we compile, uh, you know, different interesting experiential activities and um, displays to create a really, hopefully, inshallah, really beautiful and emotional uh, experience with the Quran, not just informative and educational, but some, some, a place where people can have, um, you know, fun, they can enjoy themselves interacting with different aspects of the Quran, and at the same time, seeing how the Quran has impacted different societies and cultures and, um, you know, just the beauty of it as well. Uh, just kind of exploring through all of the aspects of the Quran in one space, in one physical space where people can kind of have that relationship and that emotional experience with the Quran. And it's, um, inshallah, ho hopefully, hopefully it's something very unique. Um, I am hoping for it to be uh, a spiritual attraction, a spiritual heritage attraction for people to come and visit and, and really learn something and experience and feel something when they come here as well. I want to underline that phrase, a spiritual heritage attraction. That's just, what is, what is a spiritual heritage attraction? Can you, what would you call that? What is that? So the idea would be it comes from, you know, we're, we're familiar with cultural heritage that might be limited to um, the history of one particular culture. And we know with the Quran, the, the scope and the impact of the Quran has been just throughout the world. Um, you can't limit the impact of the Quran to one culture, one place. It really has, even in American history, like the, the founding fathers here, had some impact or some contact with the Quran and to be able to just ref I mean there's so much that we we won't be able to cover of course but just to have some reference to the scope and the impact of the Quran around the world um, and to have it one in one place um, to reflect the heritage of our spirituality as as Muslims and our 
identity that we have that is rooted in the Quran and that comes from the Quran as well. That's beautiful. I, I just, <coughs> excuse me, I just love that. And it, it ties very well. Good job, because it ties very well into my next question. So that is a spiritual heritage visit site. And you said, I hope it's unique. I, <coughs> excuse me. I feel like it's going to be very unique because I don't think I've ever been somewhere that, that says, well, I've been places that perhaps would be equal to that, but I'm not sure that they're recognizing the, that that's what they are. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. The edu educational piece of recognizing it is so important. It's so important to recognize what you're doing and what possible impact it can have on our community. So with that being said, I'd like you to imagine uh, your, your five generations future grandchild, okay? That's a long time in the future. In fact, we'll combine a couple questions with this one. So the 100 years into the future. What do you hope for the ummah? What do you hope for that individual grandchild? Because sometimes when we're thinking about the ummah, we're thinking one thing, but if we're thinking about one individual grandchild, we might have a different sort of thing that we're thinking about. So for both of those, what are your hopes? Hmm. Well, yeah, so I was thinking about this and if I compare it to my experience as, um, you know, a Muslim girl and then a Muslim woman, um, a lot of the experience has, in interacting with the outside world, has been kind of defensive and a lot of it has been uh, associated with some kind of identity politics or feeling different or having to explain oneself. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the future, future, I would really hope that we can get to a point as Muslims that um, like in, I guess, Western countries or, or yeah, in this part of the world, that we'd be able to move past that and we have like an opportunity to really have roots here, have our own history here, um, whether that's through our own institutions like Rabata, um, whether it's through, you know, individuals who have kind of, we have an inheritance of our identity and culture in in these parts of the world, in, in these lands as well, um, that we feel that we're moving towards something rather than away from something or defensive. Yeah. yeah. Can we pause? I want to say that. That's really, so, so that the future umma or maybe that grandchild is feeling like they're moving towards something instead of away from something. I think that's really powerful. And I think like when we're thinking about our children today, what are they moving away from? Like your, uh, your self or your younger sister, what are some things that you feel like you're moving away from? And what are some things you wish you could be moving toward instead of that? I think uh, we're moving, uh, we've spent a lot of time and energy moving away from, or trying to move away from stereotypes or limited ideas of our ability, what we should do, what we shouldn't be doing. Um, and to move towards just that kind of, um, ability to be part of a community but also to have your own trajectory where you're not necessarily necessarily representing everyone as a as a burdensome concept but more so as um, I choose to represent my faith and my community but I also have so many options before me um, uh, and what I want to focus on is my contribution uh -huh. uh, rather than, I guess, my image um, or the surface level of who I appear to be to others. That's really pow powerful. I want to focus on my contribution rather than who I appear to others. That's really, that's powerful stuff. So that's, so I'm going to, Another thing that Saima does has been doing for us here at Rabata recently has been doing some professional development 
uh, for our staff and our volunteers and some of our volunteers. And that professional development is circled around her specialty area, which is partially hobby, partially passion, partially studied. So you've got some expertise from your counseling course. You've got interest that has delved you very deeply into this, this thinking that I'm going to share them into typology. And then you've got your, just your, your, your own hobby. Like, I feel like it's some, it's becoming something that's so much part of how you think. And Asima is here, she's visiting. So she was talking a lot about and really giving me personally insight. So typology is, you'll, you'll explain what typology is, but she was giving me insight into how we can, how I can better serve people through understanding people better by their, by how they're sort of their makeup as opposed to assume, assuming that people are just like us. And so I, it was so interesting. I asked her to do a PD. So she's been doing that. So when you, but so talk a little bit about typology and then tie that into why is that important to you to reach this idea? Hashtag we are our history. How is knowing about typology, how is thinking about that helpful to help us become people who are focusing on our contribution rather than our appearance to others? Mm. So typology, uh, you might have heard of um, the 16 personality types or uh, MBTI, Myers-Briggs typology, which is rooted in Jungian psychology. And it's all about um, this concept of understanding the different uh, kind of mental or cognitive processes that people use or prefer to use or more comfortable to use. Um, oftentimes we assume is it's very normal and very common to assume that other people think or process information or make decisions just the same that, as we do um, and then when they don't act according to our internal script we become confused or frustrated and it leads to a lot of misunderstanding and unnecessary kind of conflict or tension or or whatever and so looking at typology has really allowed me to understand that some people are thinking based on you know uh, sensory information or intuitive information uh, the four types would be you know sensors intuitives uh, thinkers and feelers and it's really really does get quite complex and complicated and interesting Twice. yeah <laughs> um, and it's fascinating because it really allows you to understand the differences between us in a very beautiful way that we can appreciate each other. And it also allows you to focus on yourself and your own areas of development and your own strengths in a way that you can focus on your contribution. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk about your kind of your hero function, your inferior cognitive function and um, how to develop these areas that might be a blind spot to yourself so an example of that might be um i'm a sensor so i i prefer to um be in the present moment and I, i'm quite aware of my physical reality and my my blind spot is an intuitive one so making connections and and patterns between uh, big concepts and big ideas is something that I want to spend more time on because that's going to benefit my um, competence uh, and my abilities. Um, so the, the idea that really kind of inspires me and makes me just think about ways of improving the self is the idea of reaching, kind of like untapping your, that potential that's locked away inside every human being and being able to just break through these barriers that we have put up inside ourselves for whatever reason uh, in order to just you know self-actualize or um, reach those you know those areas of development where we become the better versions of ourselves and I think it, that overlaps really just really beautifully with the idea of um spiritual purification and 
the idea and so you've also mentioned the overlap with ihsan as well yes yes 100 percent, 100 percent. so when you're thinking so i i read once uh that some of the early few many of course i'm talking hundreds and hundreds of years ago now that they used to use the enneagram to help them type their students so that they would know what kind of worship to give them, what kind of, um, I guess, spiritual exercises to give them that would be useful for mm -hmm. them. And so I've done some thinking around that as well. Uh, so, uh, and you, of course, are much more of an expert in these, in typology. So let's uh, think about that. So how, if, what would an ENFP, if that's what, I'm putting you on the spot here, so, but just for fun, I mean, I'm, I, I, let me couch this in what we're talking about. Why, are we, why is this important? Because understanding the self and understanding what helps us grow, helps us become, hashtag we are our history, because we're able to actualize that self in our contribution. So for example, an ENFP, which is not you or me, so that's why I'm bringing in someone else. What do you think it would be a good exercise for an ENFP to do to grow themselves? And then I'll ask you what you think of a spiritual exercise that I'll try to think of. Mm. Okay, so a, sp a spiritual exercise or a... Or no, it can be general. Yours cognitive, from based, on, based on the cognitive functions, yours can be general. Yeah, so in general, so an ENFP is really brilliant at coming up with ideas, they're very cerebral, um, very enthusiastic and energetic oftentimes this, these are generalizations as well so you can have different types of enfps of but in general they're very inspiring people who have a, a mission or an idea or a value that they're going to kind of galvanize people around um and oftentimes they're so fast and quick between jumping between ideas and projects that they can forget to slow down and really introspect um, and consider which values they're tapping into and um, also looking after themselves. Uh, they'll forget to sleep. Sometimes they'll forget to <laughs> eat um, because they're, they're just imagining all these amazing projects and they're visionaries in so many ways that they'll just, you know, stay awake all night. Um, <laughs> things would be like learning how to balance all of those exciting projects with slowing down and introspecting and really connecting with their personal values and, and knowing why they're doing the things that they're doing and then also learning to um, tend to those maybe boring day-to-day -day needs that practical yeah Okay, so let me throw, so I'm going to try a spiritual activity. You tell me if you think this would be something good for an ENFP then, okay? Okay. How, uh, I have two different ideas. I'm not sure uh, if, if one of them is just about strengthening them or if it's actually good for them. But I'm thinking about what about something like a video blog to themselves where they there's a they're like a list of very deep personal introspective questions and instead of having to write it down they are speaking to a camera which then they save for like a month or something then they can go back and listen to it and see what their growth has been and see if they're still sort of measure how they feel would that be a healthy spiritual growth activity for an enfp Yeah, yeah, I think it would be. Um, the video element, I guess, would be quite talking. Yeah, the talking, the, that's quite fun. And isn't it? Um, so it's not complete silence. There's, there's things happening there. And um, yeah, I think a lot of times the ENFP is going to avoid the kind of heavier emotions or like they'll feel guilty about going mm -hmm. in those, those areas of their emotions. Uh, so perhaps a video would allow them that time to, to slow down, but not too much in order to, to measure that. So they're measuring, they're also measuring their introspection through videos. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that. You like that? <laughs> awesome. 
Yay! Two points for me. <laughs> I'd love to do many more of these, but I maybe we should do one more. But before we do, I want to ask you my another question mm. that I've been asking everybody else. So, what would you hope that somebody who reads about you or learns about you 75, 100? years from now what would you hope that they would say about you as far in regards to your contributions mm. well that's quite a tricky difficult one if you had asked me when i was younger it'd be like oh she did so many things to change the world for the better <laughs> like that <laughs> peace on earth yeah <laughs> It's really difficult without becoming quite sentimental. Um, but I would say my contribution and work under the umbrella of, of Rabata as an organization and uh, to be known as your student, I'd say would be, I'd be happy with. Oh, that's so touching. That's like Nana Asma'u. She has uh, all these students, and the reason we knew they were her students is because she wrote poetry about them. Often the poetry were eulogies, to be honest. Uh, often it was they had passed, and um, she was writing about them, but I think some of them were not. And I remember I was reading them, and I was just thinking how cool it is to, um, to see that relationship. So I was seeing it from the side of Nana Asma'o, but also as the side of a student, as I'm also a student. I'm on both of those uh, sides of that river, alhamdulillah. That's very touching. Very uh, touching. Thank you, Asma. Inshallah. Inshallah. Habibti. All right. Well, shall we do another uh, try at... Uh, all right, let's choose it. Maybe should we, I tell you what, someone who's watching, choose, give us a type from MBTI. Someone who knows what we're talking about, give us one in the chat box and we will say how, what they need to work on. And I will try to find a, uh, a spiritual exercise that would be healthy for them. We should totally do this like in a podcast. It'd be so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> be on the lookout for Simash. INTJ. Okay, there we go. That was the first one that came through. Okay. okay. INTJ. So tell me what are some things that need to work on? And then I'm going to try to think of a spiritual exercise that might be good for INTJ. Uh, okay. So INTJs are another like super cerebral type. And yes, very similar to the uh, ENFP, I guess. Um, that would be... Can I, can I interrupt yeah. you for a minute and say that a lot of people would struggle with you just saying that because if we just said ENFP, very often people are stuck in those individual letters. So we just said ENFP, then we said INFJ, right? INTJ. INTJ. So these feel very different to me. Mm. And so why, do, why are you saying they're so similar? Like share with us why your perspective is, oh, they're, they're going to have some real similarities. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so if we look at the letters that, I mean, they both have N. So I, ENFPs would be NFs, intuitive feelers, and INTJs would be intuitive thinkers. But if you use the four letters to look at their cognitive mm -hmm. processes, you see that um, the INTJ um, functions with, has the um, cognitive function of introverted intuition at the top and the ENFP has extroverted intuition at the top. Mm. So the intuition where the ENFP is kind of making these external connections constantly at, at a rapid pace. But the uh, INTJ introverted intuition would be um, more internal and a lot more kind of private about their uh, their thoughts and their observations and the patterns that they notice. It's more of like an internal process rather than one that has to be um, externalized. Okay. Yeah. So what what are they working on? What is their lower cognitive function? So their inferior function is extroverted sensing. Mm -hmm. And again, that's that's the sensing at the at the bottom. So it's um, their physical reality. Um, sometimes they can overthink, um, which can cause them issues. Uh, 
Um, but they're, they're really brilliant at thinking very carefully through things and, you know, considering things from all angles. And one thing that the sensing can, can come up as an obstacle is uh, reality can be an obstacle to these ideas. Uh, so in order to overcome that, of course, you want to acknowledge the, the, the physical reality around you, um, you know, your physical like food and your sleep and all of these kinds of things. But their second strongest function would be extroverted thinking, which is um, the function that is related to getting things done. So achievement, uh, organization, effectiveness. Um, INTJs would benefit from uh, planning, uh, strategizing, having goals that they're measuring and working towards achieving to get the external data points uh, from reality in order to make those visions and those ideas and plans uh, a reality. Mm, okay, so I have to think of a spiritual activity for an INTJ that you think would work well. Okay, um, while you were talking, I had a couple of different ideas. Then the last few things you said, I kind of thought, oh, I don't know if I'm, if I'm right about that. So let me see. Um, I, how about, so Ramadan is coming. And so an INTJ that would set a goal there's a big picture of goal setters, yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, set a goal of a certain number of, depending on their skill level, a certain number of Quran khitmas in the month. Hmm. I feel like they have to succeed, though. So they want to do maybe just one, some one khitma in the month. What about an INTJ stretching out of their comfort zone and volunteering to do a jizat a day at a place like Rabatar or at a masjid where they're reading Quran with other people. Too much, huh? Too hard. <laughs> Maybe, depending on the INTJ. Yeah. Uh, but I think too hard. That's like the ENTJ maybe would enjoy that. Maybe, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so no, let's back that one up. Uh, let me see. I'm struggling here. I think so my original thing when you were first talking and then I got into the things you said about goals is I was thinking that maybe an INTJ really needs time. Okay. I'm a little bit, I'm stuck a little bit because I'm the, the NTJ is messing up, messing with my head because that's where I am. So I had a couple yeah. ideas. One idea is dhikr. So just sit, sitting and doing dhikr, quiet dhikr that, that is, I think it has to have a set type, a set amount because of the T part. Like it can't just be sort of a romantic soft, I'm gonna do some thicket, but rather I want to do these, I'm gonna do this for this much time, every day for 30 days, and then I'm going to see how that's going and maybe decrease or increase. Yes? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So INTJs, the introverted intuition at the top is all about willpower. So for them to set quite a high kind of, a, a goal that most people might find difficult like mm -hmm. to sit and to do the for like half an hour or like an hour every day for 30 days would be like a challenging enough um goal that would maybe kind of motivate them to to get some to get there mm -hmm. um yeah i think that's a really good yeah yeah Yay! I got I'm two for two. Yeah. <laughs> sort of, except for that, except for that one in the middle where no, that was off. So maybe I'm one and a half for two. Alhamdulillah. That would well. That middle one would really stretch them. Yeah. It would stretch them. Yeah. yeah. So it would be a different kind of thing. Yeah. If they were feeling ready to be stretched, maybe. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and they're really good at Quran. I think also that's an important piece there. It'd be hard yeah. to do it maybe if they weren't. All right. Well, I really appreciate you coming on today, Saima. Hashtag we are our history. And we're so happy you're doing so much. You're working so hard, mashallah. I also want to say about you that she also spent two years, right, in Kuwait. Yeah. Uh, helping to, she was a teacher and helping to build this, the school Al-Awa'il. 
that I was part of a few years back, which is a school with the expressed goal of building up leadership in young uh, Muslim girls. So thank you for doing that too, mashallah. I know that you were very popular there as a teacher and as an employee. So alhamdulillah for that. And I'm just so, so, so I'm so grateful to you for everything that you do for us. And I'm so excited about this three-dimensional classroom. And I'm so excited about that other thing we're just not gonna talk about anymore. <laughs> And uh, very excited about the PD you're doing for us and just all of the work. And I'm really happy you were able to come and visit me too. It's been really nice having you here and I'll be so sad when you leave. I don't know what we're gonna do about that. Might have to just bring you back. That's the best solution yeah. for that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. All right, well, hashtag we are our history. Do you have any final words you'd like to say before we say goodbye to everyone? Um, yeah. I I just want to say thank you and say for for your generosity and these opportunities that you've provided for for me and for so many people as well so yes thank you so much thank you all right everyone happy women's history month and hashtag remember we are our history so we always want to be thinking about how we're filling up these days that are the history of our future generations all right, Sonic, everyone. Thank you.